on stress experienced by Northern Ireland Prison Service staff. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly notes the stress experienced by members of the Northern Ireland Prison Service in the course of their duties, calls on the Minister of Finance to ensure that the Northern Ireland Civil Service Human Resources Policy on Inefficiency Sickness Absent Management takes into account the stress experienced by Northern Ireland Prison Service staff and further calls on the Minister to cease the issuing of written warnings to members of the Northern Ireland Prison Service who are suffering from diagnosed mental health conditions and instead to manage the needs of these individuals through positive engagement and compassionate management which focuses on their needs. I call Doug Beatty to move the motion. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposal of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. I now invite you to open the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Go ahead. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fussy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm in no doubt whatsoever that every single person who is sitting in this assembly um, today uh, and every member of this assembly who are not sitting here today and every single party um, in this assembly understands the impact of mental health on our society uh, and, on our indiv and on the individuals. And I'm in no doubt whatsoever that every single person sitting here is a champion for mental health of all sections uh, of our society. Um, and we shout about it often enough. I certainly do, and I know other members certainly do, and we all get ourselves pictures taken um, talking about mental health and how we should do things better. Yet here we are with our civil service, who we are responsible for, who get a written warning which lasts for two years on their records if they are diagnosed with a mental health illness. It is absolutely obscene. And it affects the whole of the civil service, where somebody could have a mental health illness, have to go sick, and end up with a two-year written warning. But the people who it affects by far the most is our prison service. And those are individuals where their mental health issues stretch from anxiety to post-traumatic stress disorder. Individuals who are in the most stressful civil service job here in Northern Ireland. Our prison service makes up about a third of the Department for Justice, about a third. And yet they get roughly two thirds of the written warnings. And of those two thirds of written warnings, a quarter of them are for people who are suffering from a mental health illness. What are we saying? We're saying you have got a mental health illness, a debilitating mental health illness, and we are going to give you a warning, and that warning is for inefficiency. Inefficiency. Scandalous. So let's give, if I can please, the Assembly an understanding of what I'm talking about. So here's a prison officer who went sick with stress and anxiety. While sick, he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, which was a debilitating disease. He fought hard to get himself in a place where he could return to work, and he did return to work. And when he returned to work, he got his return to work interview, as you would expect from the Northern Ireland Civil Service Human Resources. And they accepted that he had post-traumatic stress disorder. They accepted he did everything he possibly could do to get back to work. And yet they issued him with a warning, a warning for inefficiency. I'm staggered that we do that. This is really how we treat anyone with a mental health illness. It is an abject failure in leadership, a lack of understanding of the moral component, and a laissez-faire attitude to our prison service. Yet we do have structures in place to help individuals within the prison service who have got mental health issues. 
We have the prison's well-being programme. Each prison has got a well-being officer who helps the officers. We have a welfare support service for our prison officers. We have occupational health. We have Inspire, where people can be sent to Inspire. We have the Police Rehabilitation and Re Retraining Trust, the PRRT, where individuals are now allowed to be sent to the PRRT in order to help them with their mental health illness. All of these things are in place. And you would think, if all of these things are in place, we are literally helping that prison officer with a mental health illness come to terms with his mental health and get him back to work. It doesn't work that way. Because as we're doing that with a prison officer and sending him through all of these different hoops he can jump through to help him with his mental health illness, the Northern Ireland Civil Service, HR, are going through their own routine of contacting him after 20 days to tell him that he's been absent for 20 days and they're taking note of that. Or when he returns to work, giving him a written warning. Or if he doesn't return to work, dismissal. So is that twin approach, which is a real problem? And I think sometimes we don't really get it until somebody spells out exactly what it means for that individual civil servant. And remember, the prison service are civil servants. So here's another example. A female prison officer diagnosed with depressive illness and anxiety in October 2019. Occupational health diagnosed severe reactive symptoms stopping her ability to function effectively at home and work in November. Referred to PRRT for treatment assessment in December 19. Had a dismissal meeting on the 18th of February 2020. Found unfit to work again by occupational health on the 9th of March. Finally got the PRR consultation on the 24th of March, but then was dismissed from the servants on the 3rd of April through inefficiency. If she couldn't do her job, why was she not dismissed on medical grounds? Why was it not medical discharge? Why inefficiency? Let me say this, clear and loud, and please understand what I am saying. And I'll say it again later. Mental health illness is not inefficiency. It's not. It's a mental health illness. It's debilitating. It should be treated like any other injury. Yet we do not. And I think that's shameful. And of course, some will argue that there must be some kind of management tool to reduce absenteeism. And I absolutely agree with that. There has to be. But when you put your prison officer through all of those hoops to help them with their mental health and they are unfit to come back to work, then they should be discharged on medical grounds, not inefficiency grounds. I can't fathom that. Mental health is not inefficiency. The Northern Ireland Prison Service has the highest rate of absence than any other department in the civil service, sitting between 8 and 10% per day. And we've argued many times in the Ulster Unionist Party that our prison service re needs resilience to be able to absorb that, because their job is by far the most stressful from any other. And many will say, well, the civil service do have stress all the time, but not like the prison service. Their job is like no other within the civil service. Not every day civil servants are threatened. Not every day civil servants have urine thrown on them. Not every day civil servants are assaulted. Not every day civil servants counter self-harm. Not every day civil servants face abuse and threats of sexual violence. Not every day civil servants face suicide. Not every day civil servants go home with a personal protection weapon because they are fearful of terrorists and they're under threat. But our prison service do. And that adds to the stress. And that adds to the mental anguish. And yet, when they finally tip over the edge with a mental health illness and they reach up for support, what do we say? Inefficiency. That is inefficiency. I think it is a scandal. I think we can stop it. I ask people to stop it. 
So for anyone to say to me they are just civil servants and they should be treated the same as any other civil servants, I think that's pretty dismissive. The prison officer faced greater mental health strains than any other civil service department, yet there is no allowance for them within the inefficiency sickness absence policy that uses a written warning to stop them pre presenting with mental health illness lest they lose their job. And let me tell you, that is what is happening. That we have prison officers are scared to go sick with mental health illness because they are afraid of losing their job. And we, in this assembly, alert. I applaud the health minister who's pledged to bring forward a mental health champion. I pledge, I, I applaud uh, my colleague Mike Nesbitt who asked for a mental health champion a number of years ago and the, the then health minister said she was the mental health champion. I applaud Claire Sugden when she was, a health, uh, when she was the um, justice minister as she tried to sort this out. But what am I asking today? I am asking you to support this motion and support our civil servants in the prison service. I am asking you to clearly say that having a mental health illness is not inefficiency. I am asking you to support a change in a policy where a written warning is not an appropriate management tool for those suffering from mental health illness. I'm asking for you today to say, quite simply, mental health illness is not in efficiency. And if I'm saying that for the police service, then the reality is I'm saying that for all civil servants. Mental health illness is not in efficiency. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Justice Committee, Mr. Paul Given. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member for bringing the motion and commend him in his efforts and the a very eloquent way and passionate way in, in which he has spoken. And I agree with everything that the member uh, has said. The, the prison service is often the hidden service uh, because of the very uh, nature of the job. It's not like police officers that are visible, highly respected, commended by members of the public. It's not like teachers highly commended by parents and, and will receive end-of-term gifts and so on. Prison officers aren't seen because they work behind a wall, and that's why we need to give them even more support than what other civil service sectors are getting. Their families can't go in and say, um, my mum or my, my daddy's a prison officer, because they have to keep it secret, because they live under threat, while others can be proud and tell their friends what their family do. Not the, fam not the prison service family. They're told, uh, my daddy works in an insurance company or mummy works as a secretary. Or, and you have to keep it quiet for fear of the attack that comes. Prison officers face incredible challenges outside the walls, but they also face incredible challenges inside the walls. What other public servant has to deal with a very disruptive environment at times, wanting to help others, but in return gets threatened? in return gets told in the most, at times, obscene way what they're going to do to your partner or your wife if they ever get out, what they're going to do to your children if they ever get out. What other public servant has to put up with that type of abuse? I will. Uh, thank the member for giving way. But I also agree with me that it's actually the built form, the environment with which they work, uh, with regards to the blocks, the small corridors, the doors opening outwards, uh, and, and the danger and the risk that that poses. The member has an additional minute. It is the, the physical environment in our prisons are outdated and don't lend themselves uh, as well. And we've seen improvement with Davis House, uh, and that is a step forward. But you're right, the environment is very challenging. But the type of environment that our prison officers are li living with today is the same environment that they lived with in the past. I know that from my own family circumstances, what it was like a father who served for 33 years. He worked in the provisional IRA wing. He worked in the loyalist wing, and both regarded him as a screw. Neither of them were respectful to him in terms of the job that he carried out. We know all too well what it's like to be in the prison service family, and other members here have also served and will speak shortly. And so whenever the support gets put in place for them, or the lack of it, it is right that the member brings forward this debate to the House today, and we look at the procedures that are being followed. And the, the generic way in which the civil service code applies isn't appropriate for prison officers. And, and that was identified even at a UK-wide level. There was a review carried out 
And that review identified that in some public sector roles, like armed services, emergency services, social workers and prison officers, they carry significant degree risk of developing uh, mental health problems. And it went on to recommend that the public sector employers need to identify employees at higher risk of stress or trauma, produce a framework that coordinates support for these employees and establish clear accountability for their mental health. Where is it? Where is it when it comes to prison officers? Because the generic approach that has been taken has led to a much higher level of written warning and disciplinary action than any other part of the civil service. Why is that? And what's being done to address it? And, and in the past, I sponsored numerous complaints to the uh, Ombudsman that would investigate the processes that were being followed. And unfortunately, a high level of them were found that the prison service didn't follow even their own guidance. And that's a very serious matter. What's more serious is that the ability to refer to the Northern Ireland Ombudsman to scrutinise the processes followed by the prison service no longer exists. So we can't actually tell those officers, go and get an independent position by the Ombudsman because they're not allowed to. In fact, when I raised issues on behalf of prison officers, because I know I got cite to private advice to the minister, it was a breach of the employee's contract to go to an MLA about their complaint and ask them to make representation on their behalf. And the minister could have instructed further discipline to be taken. Thankfully, the then minister, David Ford, didn't do that. He was much more reasonable than the advice that was being offered to him by his advisors. So we need to have a system in place that recognises the stress and the pressures that exist. And that's been flagged, out, uh, flagged up by the Northern Ireland Audit Office produced a report into the injury on duty for police officers and prison officers, and it identifies a lack of data when it comes to PTSD and whenever it comes to stress. There is no record whenever a medical retirement takes place that it's been as a result of stress. So if we're not collecting the data, how then are we going to address the problem? So we do need to have a much better system in place uh, that recognises the unique circumstances that our prison officers have to deal with and what they have to face. I want to commend our prison officers and their families and the commitment that they give to the job because they go the extra mile to help people that need help. And they're a uniformed organisation, but they're civil servants. They respect those in authority. But whenever you are the rank and file, you expect those that lead you to go the extra mile to protect and defend you. And there is very serious questions being asked about what representations being made at the highest levels to fight their corner. It shouldn't just be Duke Beatty and Paul Given. It should be those that are leading in this executive. It should be the Minister for Justice. And I hope that the Minister for Finance also hears the impassioned pleas by members here today in this Assembly. Thank you. I call Mrs Linda Dillon. To begin with, I support much of what has already been said. However, and I do, do support the intent of the motion. However, I do have some concerns about it. The content, specifically, the motion is narrow, and potentially there are quality issues around it. It's narrow in terms of the fact that it's, it's only around prison officers, and I don't take away from what Mr. Given has just said around the fact that maybe that needs to be looked at, and maybe it does, but that's not what the motion is asking us to do. So we have to look at the motion that's in front of us, and unfortunately, the motion that's in front, of, in front of us and how it's worded makes it very difficult to support because of these issues. I also have some concerns about whether it is actually compliant with employee law, employment law rather. So in that vein, I find it difficult to support this motion. However, I do want to outline the reasons why I support the intent of the motion and the things that I think we should be doing. So. I accept, first of all, that there is a real issue around prison staff. I accept the circumstances in which they work are very, very difficult. I accept that the challenges that they have in the place that they work are very, very difficult. They are working with some of the most challenging people that we have living here. They are working with some of the most challenging people in some of the most challenging circumstances that we have living here. And they are expected to care for those people and rehabilitate them. And I think that's where we need to focus. We need to focus on how do we support prison staff to care for those who are in prison and to rehabilitate them. Because if we don't look at that, 
If we don't decide that we're really going to focus on this, and I know that, that might not be something that's popular to say, because people want people to go to prison to be punished, and that's okay, that's one element of it. But if we put people into prison, and we treat them badly, or we don't put in place good mechanisms for them, what are we getting out at the other side? Those people are coming out of prison, and we have to deal with them when they do. So we need to ensure that we have proper processes in place for the prisoners. But this is about the staff. If the prisoners have proper processes, then that will make life easier for the staff. We have, to look, we have a responsibility to look after the prison officers, and I accept that responsibility, and I'm sure the Minister will also, and so should the Minister for Justice. And we need to ensure that we put in place a proper, robust regime that looks after them. We need an overarching strategy, and that involves the Department of Justice, the Prison Service, the Department of Finance, the Department of Health. We all have to work together to put something in place. We can't do this working in silos, as has been done so often in the past. And we've talked about this around mental health. We've talked about the need for cross-departmental working. And that has to happen in this instance also. We need to look after the prison officers. We need to support them. If there's an issue around this, this being looked at and that they're treated in a harsher way than other people within the civil service, then that needs to be reviewed and needs to be looked at. And I absolutely accept that other parts of the civil service, people working in this building, are not facing the same issues the prison officers are facing. Those people are going into work and potentially dealing with really serious issues of self-harm. And we have to ensure that when things like that happen, they're getting the proper support. And that they're not expected to come back into, to go home, deal with that and come back into work the next day and just get on with it as though nothing has happened. So I think this is, a com this is the beginning of a conversation. Whilst we may not be able to support this motion today, this is absolutely only the beginning of a conversation about how we look after our prison staff, about how we change the processes and the circumstances under which they work, and about how we change things for prisoners. So in all of that, I think there needs to be a proper strategy, and we all need to work together. So Doug, you're on the committee with me, as, as is Paul Given as the chair of it, obviously. So I think on the committee, we need to work together to see what we actually really can do moving forward with the other departments, with the Department of Finance, with the Department of Health, with the prison service. What can we really put in place that's going to make a real difference in these people's lives? Because it's not just about don't give them a ladder telling them that they're inefficient. We need to help them. We need to fix the problem. Because we're going to need prisons, prison officers into the future. And are we going to ask people to come into a prison service where we're going to say, we know we are going to be, your mental health is going to suffer massively, but we're not going to put in place anything to strategically deal with that. We're just not going to send you a ladder. That's not good enough. It's not the way to move forward. So for me, whilst not supporting this motion, I absolutely support the intent of it. I support the present staff in terms of looking after their mental health, and I support them in trying to do the best job they can do. And we need to ensure that people who come into that role are curers and rehabilitators. It's the prison governor's job to look after the security. The prison staff job is to cure for and rehabilitate those who are within the prison, and we need to give them the tools with which to do that. And in that, I think we will help them with their mental health. Thank you. As this is the member for East London Derry, Cara Hunter's maiden speech, I would remind members that maiden speeches are heard without interruption. I call Ms Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, before I speak today uh, on this motion, I would first like to acknowledge the loss of a giant in our party and to the people of East Derry. I speak, of course, of my predecessor, the Honourable John Dallet. John was a man who steadfastly served his constituency of East Derry for over 40 years. Living in East Derry, John's legacy is as evident as it is poignant. He left an indelible mark on his constituency. We remember John. And though we are grieved by his loss, we take comfort in his immense achievements and that he was always the champion of the underdog. From becoming the first Nationalist Mayor of Coleraine to his unwavering commitment to the heartbreaking Inga Maria Houser case, John always demonstrated the depth of his conviction and care. In a time of great political upheaval and distress, when it was far from easy to be an SDLP representative, John served with bravery, with tenacity, dignity and diligence. I can only hope that I too might serve East Derry with the same courage and conviction that guided him. We shall never see his like again. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I stand here today as a proud Irish nationalist. 
and I am extremely proud to be a member of the SDLP, a party with a legacy of fighting for civil rights and built by peacemakers such as John Hume and Seamus Mallon. I was three years old when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, therefore it would be untrue to suggest I recall the sense of hope that it created here. But what I do know is that that sense of hope has begun to fade for the ceasefire generation, my generation. As Brexit looms ever closer, we live in a time of great economic, social and political uncertainty. Every day, I am contacted by concerned constituents regarding the impact Brexit will have on their farms and our local tourism. To add to that, we are in the middle of a global pandemic. COVID-19 has added greatly to that economic uncertainty. We must do everything within our power to ensure our communities remain protected. I know the depths of East Derry's issues. I know its worries and its obstacles facing its youth. But I also know of East Derry's hopes and its kind and welcoming people, its best qualities and the ambition of its youth for a better future. Many have lost faith in all of us here in Stormont. There are many challenges. But what I see is a generation of young people crying out for opportunity. We must work diligently to stop the mass exodus of our talented young people leaving to other shores. We need investment in skills and education. We need apprenticeship opportunities, faster rural broadband and stronger transport links. Rural areas can no longer go isolated and underfunded. The forgotten communities in the Northwest have been neglected for too long. Many feel there is an undeniable regional imbalance, a postcode lottery. A child from Park or Drum Cern won't always have the same opportunities as a child from Belfast due to the continued lack of investment to the Northwest. And I feel this must change. It is my obligation, along with everyone else in this chamber, to build a place that our people not only can survive in, but thrive in. A place of opportunity, of understanding and of growth. Like many, I believe your story is your power. And for me, I wouldn't be standing here today if I wasn't one of many who had lost a dear friend to suicide. Like so many in Northern Ireland, I feel mental health is an issue that rises above politics. For as we all know, mental illness recognises not race, colour or creed. It is blind to income and deaf to religion. Growing up, I looked at the Assembly with everything ranging from disappointment to dire disillusionment. It was only when I had lost my best friend at the start of its collapse in 2017, I realised I had to do something, and that is why I am here today. I now move to the motion at hand, and would like to thank the members here today who have brought this motion forward. As the new MLA, I look forward to working with colleagues right across this House on mental health support. Historically, stress and psychological disorders have consistently been the main cause of long-term sickness absence in the Northern Irish Prison Service. Statistics reveal that in the last three years there has been an increase in prison officers taking time off work due to stress, anxiety and depression. And of course this reflects the extremely difficult environment in which they work. With McGilligan Prison in my constituency, I know prison officers face many challenges. We must strive to support them and their emotional well-being. Today, we support the spirit of this motion and the good intent behind it. However, we have serious reservations of the mechanism proposed to be deployed as it could raise serious unintended inequalities for employees across the system. I hope we can work together to find a resolution that supports all of our citizens here facing mental health in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, and may I be the first to congratulate the member on her maiden speech in this chamber. I'm sure we'll hear plenty more from her in the coming days and weeks. I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. As a member of the Alliance Party, a party that has stood for the rule of law, peace and justice since our foundation, I welcome the opportunity to speak in support of our prison officers today. There are few roles in society of which we ask more. Prison officers play a vital role and we say thank you to them for it. As the Prison Officers Association has stated, prison officers have risen to the challenge of COVID-19 they are key workers and demonstrating their professional qualities, attending work in dangerous circumstances, and we recognise the work that they carry out on our behalf. They are brave men and women, not only rising to the challenges of COVID-19, but all other challenges that we see in our prisons on a daily basis. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have met with prison officers who have been harassed and threatened in the line of duty. Intimidated with information gathered by terrorist surveillance of their loved ones, required to be first responders to serious self-harm 
attempted suicide and actual suicide, assaulted, trapped at knife point in cells. And of course today, I remember the prison officers who have been cowardly and brutally murdered in Northern Ireland, none of which is in vain and all of which is to keep us safe. I've sat with serving and former male and female prison officers who are physically and mentally injured as a result of the trauma they have endured on our behalf. They deserve our utmost respect, gratitude, and the best, safest, and most secure health and well-being provision we can offer them. And I welcome the work that the Justice Minister is undertaking to achieve this aim. Improved sickness absence procedures, and in particular, sickness absence communications, are part of a wide range of matters that I have raised with the Department of Finance and the Department of Justice on behalf of prison officers. I don't, however, believe that ceasing sickness management procedures with regards to written warning without an alternative mechanism to manage sickness is a comprehensive or appropriate rep response to this matter at this stage. Whilst improved sickness absence procedures is important, there are many other measures needed to prevent prison officers experiencing physical and mental ill health in the first place. I welcome the Prisons Well and Inspire Health and Wellbeing programmes, and I look forward to meeting with the Prison Service to seek update as to progress on a wide range of issues and reports, such as that of the former Prison Service Head of Psychology, Dr Jackie Bates-Gaston, which made a number of constructive recommendations on prison officer wellbeing provision. It has been my privilege to work with prison officers towards improved health and wellbeing support over a number of years, and I pay tribute to those prison officers that have been involved in that campaign. I worked for, and I particularly welcome, the extension of the excellent Rehabilitation and Retraining Trust services to serving prison officers, and I hope that the referral pathway and timescale for access to this safe, secure and bespoke service can be improved and eligibility for it be extended to former prison officers. I am grateful for Justice Minister Naomi Long's decisive action to commission a review of support services for former prison officers, and I would ask that the UK Government and Northern Ireland Executive consider the acute troubles-related trauma experienced by many former prison officers and their families and find a way to deliver funded access to the Rehabilitation and Retraining Trust for former prison officers as well as current prison officers as soon as possible. It is right that we work to improve the health and well-being of prisoners. A healthier prison population will assist prison officers, but we must do all we can to protect the mental health and well-being of our prison officers in their performance of this challenging and vital role for our society. Thank you. Mr. Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I rise to support uh, this motion uh, very much so. Uh, can I just say, Mr. Speaker, isn't it great that we have private members' business back into this House? I believe it should never have been left off the agendas in the first place. I think they are vital and important to get members' points of view across. And I think this debate here illustrates why it's so important to have private members' motions. And can I commend Doug? Uh, I, I sit with him on the Justice Committee and. and uh, I respect him for the job he does, and it's great to see an MLA, an individual MLA, picking up an issue and really running with it and forcing it into the mindsets of every other MLA. So I commend him on this, and I'm sure he will reciprocate and support me in my fight against uh, Sony and, and trying to get independence for that and, and all the other issues that we, we fight for on an individual basis, because these are very important. And not every member can fight every issue. So it's very important that MLAs pick up something and run with it and make a real difference. And if we can all do that, if every single MLA does that, the world could be a better place. On this actual motion, and I, I commend him for it, he is absolutely right, absolutely right, to bring this issue to our attention. And he's absolutely right about the need for prison service staff to be treated with respect and dignity, and to be treated differently from other civil service staff for the simple 
issue that they do a completely different and specific role. There is nowhere else in the civil service, albeit some very difficult roles and jobs, but there are no, nowhere else where in the course of your full day's work, you interface and interact with people who have massive issues, ma people who have massive problems, and also people who are highly dangerous. And also then go home and still face the spectre of threats and intimidation. There is no other aspect in life, no other job in the civil service that contains that. And not only that, when they go to work, as I said earlier, the, the built environment is not conducive. Now, we have made great strides, but it's not conducive to safety and also to mental health and also to well-being. Let's face it, it's not. Can I just commend the leadership of the prison service? Because when I, came, when I became an MLA 10 years ago and in my duration as an MLA, I have seen a vast improvement in the leadership of the prison service. Uh, to the point we're at now. Now, much more can be done, but I think we have to give credit where credit's due. And I, I do think that what the member has raised around the, issue, around the issues about the procedures that the civil service go through to bring somebody back to work, if, if you are feeling mental health or stress and you are being told that you aren't efficient, if you have received a warning that can stay on your books or your record for two years, that is so impactful. That is so impactful that it actually reinforces the mental illness. And it's only going to make conditions worse, not make them anywhere near better. And the stress and strains of that individual, the heap that's being placed upon them, the weight that's being placed upon them by colleagues, by their leadership, is immense. And surely that is wrong. Surely that is wrong. Where is the strong arm of comfort here? Where is the wraparound service? Where is the protection? These people risk our lives, their lives for us. The yes, yes, I will. Um, I appreciate the member giving way. Um, would he also agree with me that uh, it will be viewed by many prison officers that people oppose this motion on the basis of technicalities and that that will send out a very counterproductive message? Member has an additional minute. Yes, I agree. If it's okay to protest and fight for one sector of the world or a community, surely it's okay to be in here today talking about a specific sector of our civil service. Absolutely. When, it, when we see so much difference in the staff and what they have to endure and work through on a daily basis. I've been in the prisons. I have seen the psychological effect that some prisoners place on prison, ser prison service officials. I have seen the games they've played. I, I walked into the, the separated wings and just because I was a suit that nobody knew, they wanted to know who I was and who gave the prison service the permission for me to be there. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous that some of these prison, uh, prisoners, uh, the, the charade in the game they play, but it's a very dangerous game they play, and it comes with so many risks for our prison service that they can't, they can't rest when they're home. But not only them as, as prison officers, their families. How many families, how many members of their families have been intimidated, both physically, psych, uh, psychologically, uh, and, and how many have been seriously injured? because their a parent at work happens to work as a prison officer. It's horrendous what these families go through, and the pressure that they go through is undeniable, and something needs to change, and we need to fix uh, this for these people. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Gemma Dolan. For the prison service to fulfil its aims in relation to the management and rehabilitation of offenders, we must provide appropriate care and support for the staff for carrying out this challenging work. But I would be concerned that to cease the issuing of written warnings to members of the prison service who are suffering from diagnosed mental health conditions, as this motion suggests, may not be the most appropriate way to do that. The mental health crisis that we find ourselves in is wider than the prison service, 
and a Sinn Féin spokesperson on workers' rights, I can't support this for just one section of the public service. This would create a number of equality issues whereby prison service members will be treated differently to others in the public service, not to mention those in the private sector. I am very sympathetic to the thrust of the motion because, as we know, prison sentence, as has already been alluded to, can be highly stressful for prisoners, prison officers and other prison staff. For the prison officers in particular, it can be a highly challenging environment to work in with a lot of stressful responsibilities and pressures. I am under no illusion that they face pressures and responsibilities that are unique to the prison service and that demands can leave a mental toll. It is imperative that there are adequate support mechanisms in place to assist prison officers who may be struggling. This must be done by showing empathy and compassion. However, to cease the practice of issuing written warnings may have unintended consequences far beyond the intentions of this motion. It is for the reasons above that Sinn Féin submitted an amendment to this motion to broadly capture and support the main thrust and sentiments of the motion, but to target more specific and appropriate actions that this motion as it stands, but unfortunately this was not accepted. Every one of us as elected representatives have a role to play in breaking the stigma that is attached to mental health. One way to do that is to ensure that the civil service sickness absence policy is up to date and treats all public sector workers, not just those in the prison service, with compassion and respect and the positive engagement is used that focuses on their individual needs. Thank you. I call Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I uh, just want to say congratulations to Carol Hunter, a father's speech. It was great. I'm so proud that we have so many young people right across the floor here and able to make such great speeches. Thanks very much. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't meaning it that way, I was meaning it that way. You know who you saw yourselves, anyhow. I welcome the opportunity, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, to speak in this debate. The impact of this pandemic on mental health will be felt for many years to come. People of all ages will have been impacted by the fear and stress caused, and there is still doubt that the predicted recession will bring its own challenges. Whilst there will be few people left unscathed by the effects of the pandemic, I think we will all agree that frontline workers, especially those working on the COVID wards, will need support for their mental health and well-being. This motion concentrates solely on the stress levels experienced by prison staff. As an Assembly member privileged to serve the people of the Lagan Valley constituency, which members know includes many people who work in McGabberty Prison. I am keen to see recognition of the unique challenges faced by prison officers and support staff. I myself am from Moira. My wife is from McGabberty. I remember the old airdrum where it was built, where the prison was built on, and I remember the building of it and how the fortunes of there all changed. The point I am making on this is I also uh, even though I am uh, from that nationalist community, I have got to know, working in a small bar in Moira, quite a lot of prison officers of all ranks and all ages and both sexes. Living under stress and threat is not anything new to the staff there. Indeed, some have paid the ultimate price of our thoughts, of the ultimate price, and our thoughts today should also reflect on the recent murders of David Black and Adrian Ismay. And I use this opportunity, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, to call on all threats against our prison staff to be removed. Any human resources policy on the management of sickness and absenteeism must include help and support for those suffering from mental health, but must also allow managers to take formal, disciplinary, and, as when necessary, in keeping with best practice in employment, law and the needs of the service as a whole. Unfortunately, the latter part of this motion calls on the Finance Minister to cease the issuing of written warnings to members of the Northern Ireland Prison Service who are suffering from diagnosed mental health conditions and instead to manage the needs of those individuals through positive engagement and compassionate management which focuses on their needs. Uh, this represents a significant divergence from common practice, not only in the public sector, but also the private sector. 
Absolutely. I thank the member for giving way. Can I ask you a very pointed question? If you're off sick with COVID-19, do you think it's right that, that when they return to work, they are issued a written warning citing inefficiency? And if you say it's not right, why is it right for mental health? Member has an additional minute. Um, thank you, Mr. Prince, and Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Doug, for your intervention. I mean, a lot of what we are discussing here, I, I, I'm in parallel, I'm in agreement, I'm trying to be in agreement with you, but it's the management of this, it's how this manages through, and it's best practice and work. It's for all of that embracing uh, the, the, the civil servants, our prison staff, and anyone else that finds themselves under stressful COVID-19 related, there should be a mechanism there, and that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying in order to see that that's, that's what we develop, and that's the point of trying to make the discussion. But I'm not sure that your motion fulfills that or helps us get to where we want to be. This represents a significant divergence from common practice, not only in the public sector, but also the private sector. On reading this, if accepted, would create special treatment of prison service staff. I ask the proposers of the motion to clarify their intentions on this point. If this were agreed, then what would be the repercussions be for other public sector workers suffering stress and mental ill health? Where would such a policy begin and end? And in a way, that's me answering back your question and putting it back to yourselves. Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, how could you follow that? Uh, I'll, try my, I'll try my best. Um, just want to be the third member to, to welcome our newest member and uh, her speech, and I, I thought you did exceptionally well. And I'd also just like to make the House aware at the earliest point of the passing of Billy Bell. Uh, Billy Bell, former member of the Assembly, uh, passed earlier on this day. I'd like to, on behalf of my party, pass on my condolences. And I look forward to the, the moment when we can uh, pay our respects to, um, to his family. Um, I've, I've, yes, absolutely. Uh, I have to rise, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I mean, that's the first that I've heard that Billy has passed away, and I want to send my condolences to his family. But I want to go back to 25 years ago. My house was petrol bombed uh, with my children in it one night, and first at my door was Billy Bell. May God bless him and may God rest him. Uh, I will let them, the member will have additional time, and I will be a bit more flexible. So. Um, Mr. Robbie Butler. Um, Mr. Thank Mike you. Nesbitt's looking at me sideways because I said it would be flexible. <laughs> Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you for your words, um, Mr. Catney. I'm sure the family will be uh, warmed by those words at this very difficult time. I've listened to the debate and have no notes for this, um, and I don't need notes for this one, guys, because this will be uh, one from the heart. Um, and probably some stories, but they will not be told out of school because they pertain to those people that I served with for a number of years. Um, but I've listened to some of the members give the reasons why, in essence, they might support this, but today they can't. And I would say to you, well, let's look at the report commissioned by the prison service a number of years ago, produced by Jackie Bates Gaston, the Northern Ireland uh, prison service psychologist, which was shelved and hidden in a library uh, and not, not put into action because, you know what? It recognised the very things that we're talking about today as problems from years ago. And these problems have existed, guys, for decades in this country. And I don't want to rehearse the old politics of blaming who was, who was the fault for, for the stress the prison officers face. And, and, and much has been made of the inequality that this policy might make. That doesn't stand because prison officers are not civil servants, no matter what it says on the paper. They're not civil servants. They cannot be treated like ordinary civil servants. Civil servants give a great service to this country. But the threats and trouble and pain that operational prison officers go through is absolutely unique. I joined the prison service in 1996, which was pre-ceasefire. And there was talks of talks. There was, there was much going on. But at that time when I joined and signed up, I signed up knowing that my life was probably going to be under threat. In 2020, is it any different? What does the daily day and routine of a prison officer actually look like? I'm going to tell you what it looks like and what it feels like. You wake up and you have to go to work. And you're concerned about your day. 
And one of the first things that you will do is check under your car. You will check under your car. And if you're taking a member of your family, as it was in my day, with my daughter, my one-year-old daughter, to be child-minded and you're placing the child in the car, you understand that your family also carries the burden of that risk that you took when you decided you were going to serve. You do your journey to work. And unfortunately, as we've heard, Officer Black, after checking under his car, didn't make it to his place of employment. This is only a number of years ago. Do normal and everyday civil servants face that same threat? Absolutely not. No, they don't. So, you get to work. And what are you thinking about your day? I tell you what you're thinking about your day. You're wondering what's coming next. I can tell you, it's a state of hypervigilance working in a prison. It is not the normal routine. I worked in the fire service. I have worked where you've had to make life and death decisions for yourself, for your, your crew, for your teams, for the people that you're trying to rescue. And I can tell you, that stress is not the same as stress faced by prison officers. I went from being a butcher and enjoying that, the chatty man across the counter, no threats, into this really obscene environment. And I tell you, Mr. Frew, you, you talked about going in as a suit, and I can tell you, I would, I would actually say, if you ever get the chance to go in and be an undercover prison officer, that's the only way you will experience what it's like. Because the management and the officers are on their best behaviour when you're there and you're safe. And even the prisoners watch the P's and Q's to a certain extent. It's almost, it's, 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 worth, it's worth doing. So you're in this environment, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Not only are you a concern for your own safety, and the safety of other prisoners, by the way, because not all prisoners are bad, not all prisoners are naughty. Some prisoners are there due to circumstances. You've got the safety of the prisoners, you've got the safety of your team. Now, what has happened over the years in the prison service? They've been faced with cuts, and I'm disappointed that the Justice Minister is not here with us today, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I applaud the, the Finance Minister for being here, and I thank you for that, but I would like to have seen the Justice Minister here to hear about the staff that sit under her tutelage. You're concerned about the, the members of your team, their safety, your safety, you're hypervigilant. Did the member give way? Uh, absolutely. Thank, th thank the member for, for giving way, and it's been a privilege to work with the member on prison officer health and wellbeing. We, we the member care to reflect as well that obviously whilst the Justice Minister isn't here today, given that the matter pertains directly to the Department of Finance, that she has already early in her tenure engaged with and visited prison officers. Absolutely would. And as the former Justice Minister Claire Sugden has made it her priority, I hope that after today's debate, the Justice Minister makes this her number one priority. Because as I've said, prison officers are not civil servants. They're operational prison officers. I operated a, an attendance management policy in the fire service. It wasn't a civil service attendance management policy. It was for the fire service. We needed bespoke. It goes further than the intention of this motion, but I think what has been put forward is reasonable by my colleague Doug Beatty. What happens with that manifestation of that heightened sense of hypervigilance? It's mental health. It's the impact that it has on your mental health. We talk about PTSD, we know what a trauma looks like, we know what a physical assault looks like. Someone indeed had talked about urine being poured over you. Do you know what has changed? It used to be that if you had urine thrown over you, you could report that. The police were brought in, it was investigated, and it was done. Not mine. Because they've adopted a new standard. It's not even an assault anymore. I mean, I think it's scandalous how our prison service staff have been treated. What are the implications for the future, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, if I can indulge even for 30 seconds? I think we are storing up a real problem for our prison service in terms of retention. I think we have devalued the job in terms of payment, in terms of this ridiculous policy with regard to attendance and inefficiencies. I think it's scandalous. Uh, my solidarity is with many of my former colleagues who have had to leave the job early, and I think we're storing up a problem in regards to retention and valuing our prison service operational staff. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and to the other members of this House, I'd ask you just to take it on board that there's no intention behind this motion other than to do the very best for prison officers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, can I also put on record my sympathy to the family of Billy Bell, as well as being an Assembly member here, I think, without fear of contradiction, uh, he is the only person who ever was the Mayor of Belfast and the Mayor of Lisburn. So that was quite a a record to have, so I also want to place on the record of the House uh, my deepest sympathies. I call Mr John Blair.
Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And before I speak on the motion, can I take a moment to, to briefly uh, add to the comments you made there about Billy Bell and do so on behalf of my party? I knew Billy just a little bit in my early days in local government. I know he was a very highly regarded man throughout local government and across all political parties. May I also take uh, an additional brief moment to, on behalf of the Alliance Party, welcome Cara Hunter here, congratulate her on an excellent uh, maiden speech and wish her all the best from those of us on these benches for the future. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I think it's become clear that there is probably no one here who disagrees with the sentiment expressed in the motion before us. The motion, which very appropriately reflects the huge pressure placed upon those involved in the Northern Ireland Prison Service <clears throat> in the course of their duties and also when off duty. Right across our public services, there are pressures and sometimes the most challenging and stressful working circumstances thrust upon those involved in public facing roles. But can I sound a note of caution? None of these stresses, Principal Deputy Speaker, should ever be compared either favourably or unfavourably to another. All of them are stresses or problems or threats placed upon an individual who has feelings, who has family and who suffers just the same as anyone else. Um, it's no surprise, therefore, Principal Deputy Speaker, that there are business areas of public service delivery where levels of illness, including mental health illness, are historically higher than average. It follows, then, that attention will be paid to these levels of sickness and procedures to deal with and manage these will be reviewed or refreshed. And many of us who have worked in other jobs before we came to this place have undergone those changes in, in process. Um, yes, I'm happy to give away. I appreciate the member giving way, but does he realise, though, that whilst we recognise mental health is right across the spectrum of society, we're really talking about the warning procedures that are in place in the civil service, which affects disproportionately present service to the tune of 60 per cent. Now, if you look at the wide paramics view of, of civil service, why is it that 60 per cent of these warnings are going to the present service? There's something wrong. The member has an additional minute. That, Deputy Speaker, I'm not averse to a closer look at this in other fora, such as the, the Justice Committee, but, but I'm mindful that uh, those who work for the Northern Ireland uh, Prison Service are subject to the Northern Ireland Civil Service Handbook rules, the same as everyone else within that service. But I want to stress I'm not averse to wider and separate um, review of those processes in, in other appropriate places. Um, I think whilst recognising, uh, as I was saying, the, the excellent work prison officers do in unique circumstances, we need to remain mindful that HR processes and leave management within the Northern Ireland Civil Service, as I said, are undergoing extensive change. Um, and this has been done to ensure, as far as is possible, best practice and consistency of approach. It's perfectly reasonable to expect maximum and sympathetic consideration, of course, when dealing with mental health related absence. It is reasonable also to assume each case is considered on an individual basis and on its merit. And we are told, and we guess we have to accept at this stage, that this is in fact the current practice. The difficulty, Principal Deputy Speaker, with the motion for me is that it seems to seek a separate process for Northern Ireland prison officers to that which is available for others in a similar role, to that which is available for every other employee in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. I refer to I'll give way. Thank you, uh, Member, for giving way. Um, would the Member agree that there is a change to the conditions and services for the prison services that has led to this? They did at one time have their own book conditions and sickness procedures. There has been a change a number of years ago, which the Minister might refer to. It has been a retrograde step to, to change that. And if that is the case, why can we not change back? And why should the prison service, when they are faced with so many everyday, everyday pressures that lead to these conditions, not seek that change through this motion? I would imagine, Principal Deputy Speaker, if I could reflect briefly, that the not change it back is related directly to the consistency and approach for all of the employees within that service that I reflected um, upon a moment ago. And I may not give way again as I'm coming to the end now. Um, the motion seeks that, that which I refer to, by the way, in the, the backdrop of the fact that there are more working days in, lost in the Northern Ireland Prison Service than in the PSNI, for example, or in other comparable services across these islands. So it is not unusual or unreasonable that this matter is being examined and dealt with. That does not mean that that dealing cannot be reviewed as it goes. Um, so, yes, Principal Deputy Speaker, we must seek to do more in mental health and wellbeing within that service 
in a real, effective and joined up way, but we need to address a number of factors in doing this also. Best practice and yes, value. Consistency of approach and provision, which will across public service include warnings sometimes where appropriate. And lastly, we need to consider the fact that absences place additional pressure of those, on those who remain in work. Regrettably, Principal Deputy Speaker, the motion, the honourable and sentimental aspiration, neither addresses nor delivers on this detail. And I am obliged, therefore, to oppose the motion. Call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, let me firstly say that uh, I take the mental health crisis in our society extremely seriously. I raise it um, repeatedly on the Health Committee, which I sit on. Uh, it is one of the biggest health crises that faces us and needs to be addressed in a, a systematic and radical way, with an expansion of funding across society and a real uh, proper mental health provision uh, in place. Um, the mental health crisis impacts upon all elements of society, as people have indicated, although the poor and more marginalised uh, <coughs> in a more disproportionate way. And no doubt, obviously, as, as people have already referred to the stats, many prison officers make up the, the many people who need increased mental health support and services in place. Although it would be remiss, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to not mention, uh, and I think it is unfortunate here, uh, that we have a motion on, on mental health problems in prisons that does not mention um, the very deep and painful uh, mental health crisis faced by prisoners too. Um, I think Ms Linda Dillon might have mentioned it previously. I missed the start of her comments. Um, and yeah, briefly, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you for giving way. Um, there were a number of debates in the, in the previous session in around 2016, uh, which talked about in, death, uh, in custody deaths uh, by prisoners. And that's a very, it's a very sad thing when any prisoner uh, loses life. And I, I just was uh, at the time got the chance to speak on it. And I know from prison service staff they do deal with prisoners. And there's a high prevalence of mental ill health in uh, prisons. But would the member accept that actually prison officers? In dealing with people with a high prevalence of mental health, the very fact that they have criminal sentences, high levels of addiction, that that is also a further trauma. And the build-up of the traumas that actually the, uh, prison officers are faced with is actually exponential in comparison to any other profession that there is. And actually, they do care about the mental health of prisoners in there and actually put themselves at risk to protect the mental health of those prisoners that you're talking about. OK, before I call Mr Carl in, can I say Mr Carl is entitled to another minute, but Mr Butler took a minute off him in getting him his entitlement to another minute. So can we please, intervention should be brief. Thank you, Mr Carl. And if I were to say Mr Butler, he raised a number of questions, but uh, I mean, I think the point stands in terms of do they face um, prison officers face mental health problems, of course. Are they dealing with people who face mental health problems, of course? Uh, but I think the point uh, remains and, and still stands that uh, there's nothing in the motion that mentions the mental health of, of people, uh, of prisoners. Um, and obviously, I think it was a BBC report a number of years ago indicated that the, the figure uh, of mental health problems in prisons is very, very high. I can't remember the exact figure offhand, but it was um, astronomically high. Uh, and I think, obviously, for me, um, Mental health problems in prisons must be dealt with in a way that doesn't leave the door open to other problems, some other members have indicated. And, and my concern with this motion is that it could have problematic consequences in terms of granting preferential treatment to prison officers over prisoners themselves. And what happens if there are problems that do arise in prisons, as can arise in any institution, uh, with prisoners uh, often being on the receiving end of them? Um, and examples of prison officers maybe not acting in the best or the appropriate behaviour, um, and I'd be concerned that that um, behaviour is not will not be, would not be dealt with in the, in the appropriate way. And this motion uh, uh, allows for that to to be the case. I would also be concerned about um, the outcome of this motion leading to situations where uh, some prison officers are absolved from facing disciplinary uh, proceedings, such as written warnings if serious issues uh, emerge in prisons, as they often do. Um, and I feel it's, that it is disappointing that some members obviously try to amend the motion um, and to, I understand, reflect those concerns, but it wasn't uh, selected. 
uh, and if it was, I uh, probably would have uh, supported uh, the motion. Um, and I think for me, the problem uh, with the motion is that it, it, it disregards normal due process for prison officers, regardless of what they uh, may have done or what they have alleged uh, could have been alleged to have done. Uh, and I think it's, it's welcome that this issue should be considered for civil service uh, workers more generally. But I can't help uh, but point out that quite often, uh, when the issue of mental health and ab absence in the civil service is discussed on media outlets, quite often some parties um, in this chamber often bang on about high levels of, of absence and sickness uh, and uh, don't really understand the mental health problems that other civil service workers uh, face as well. So I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Comments, Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the members for bringing this matter forward. Um, and can I too welcome Cara to the chamber today for her maiden speech? Um, it was only a couple of months ago I was making mine, so <laughs> welcome. Um, mental health issues in prisons don't just affect those that are in the care of the prison service. And as we know, and other members have discussed today, mental health issues can affect everyone, including prison officers. There have been a number of studies that have investigated the working lives of prison officers across the world, as well as in the UK. Some have shown that psychological engagement with offenders and the mental demands of the job can lead to high levels of workplace stress. Others have suggested prison environment and the rules governing daily life inside prison can be seriously detrimental to mental health. And prisons are often difficult and demanding working environments for all levels of staff. Dealing with prisoners with unrecognised and untreated mental disorders can further affect the environment and place even greater demands upon the staff. A prison that is responsive to and promotes the mental health of prisoners is more likely to be a workplace that promotes the overall morale and mental health of prison staff and should therefore be one of the central objectives of good prison management. And I know the Northern Ireland Prison Service has taken steps to address mental health through programmes and having support systems in place for prisoners. More of course can be done, more should be done, but today what we are doing is discussing the experiences of the staff. The civil service, um, civil service HR policy is one that is used by every person that is employed by the civil service, and the problem that is raised here today seems to be with the way in which staff, particularly the prison service frontline staff, are treated under the so-called inefficiency part, and how much pressure is put on people who are off sick. I have heard of times where prison staff have been pressurised to return to work despite being off receiving cancer treatment. Others have spoken of being assessed as unfit for work referred to counselling assistance and other therapies, and these therapies are often subject to delay. And I know of an instance where a staff member signed off and waiting for therapy to start was receiving letters asking when they were returning to the very workplace that they had just been signed off work from. They were threatened that if they did not return, they would be receiving a warning, finding themselves caught up in this inefficiency policy despite their GP letters confirming their health status. It would seem that as soon as, soon as trigger points are breached, the letters are sent out. So I would welcome some further information on how this process is actually set up, and if someone who is off sick breaches trigger points in their contract or within the HR policy, does automatically letters get sent out and are they automatically under investigation? Could that process not be done a lot better? Last week at the Justice Committee, I questioned the officials on the mental health support that people may need when returning to work in this new normal, as well as adapting to the changes that COVID has brought to our work and home lives, our family and friends for all ages and will be felt for years to come. I was told that the Inspire service is available for all staff within the department, which is of course welcome, and I know that the WELL programme is also in place for prison officers. Having process, processes in a workplace is key, and that all staff know that they have a support line there if they need to read it, reach out, but support must be made of it. I will. Do agree with me that we should not be offering services after a mental health issue arises? The protection should be put in place prior to it. If we know that there's a prevalence and an issue there, then why are we not putting in place a strategy to actually deal with it in advance? I thank the member for her intervention. The member, yes. uh, member has an additional minute. Thank you. I would completely agree. And I think this brings up just a wider point of how we deal with mental health in our society and in workplaces. But absolutely, there should be um, support services there for anybody that needs it. So, in terms of having a work processes in workplaces, a key and staff must know that they have a support line there if they need to reach out. So, support must be made available and must be clearly expanded. I know this motion is in no way to say that people working in different workplaces do not suffer mental health issues, and we know that anyone and everyone are affected by mental health. It is, of course, a fundamental part of human health and one that needs much, much more consideration, awareness, and action to be taken in all workplaces. 
but that for the purposes of this motion today, where we have some people working in front line in our prisons that are dealing with people who are in prison, who have addiction issues or self-harming or attempted suicide, there must be a sensitive system in place that recognises that and does not unduly or unfairly mean that people are subject to disciplinary action for being off ill with mental health issues. So I would hope that the Minister, and I'm glad that he is here today, could outline the processes by which staff are treated when they return to work, our debrief, debrief, debriefs used in the civil service, but also in particular the prison service to see if staff are feeling okay or offer support, our management fully equipped to recognise when there are issues. So are, are HR, HR policies sensitive, or do we need a bit of a rethink, uh, not just on this on for our prison service, but across the civil service? Can we use this as a means to independently review sickness absence across the Northern Ireland Prison Service, like has been called by for, by, that has been called for by Community Union? And also, can we look at the physical building, as Mr Fraser mentioned earlier on, of our prisons and how they contribute to the mental health of both prisoner and staff, to look at making prison structures safer for staff? Can we look at more mental health assistance to be offered to those affected? I do, like others, have some issue with the wording of this motion in terms of the written warning systems and their use, as this could pose problems for employment law, but I hope that this could be addressed by moving forward with the departments involved. Stopping the issue of, uh, issuing of written, written warnings may prove to be inoperable in one section of the civil service and not for all, so I'd like to hear from the Minister on this, but I don't think that this is enough to stop this motion going through, as it's an important issue to be looked at and what actually, actions can actually be taken. So I hope that through this motion there will be greater awareness of mental health across the Northern Ireland Civil Service and that not one civil service is treated unfairly or felt that they have been on the basis of mental health. We have to take this opportunity to assess where we are, how we deal with mental health in our society, in the home, in our communities and in our workplaces. And we must recognise that though there are differences in people's jobs where the structures of the policy has control over. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is the last member who has indicated that they wish to speak. I therefore call the Finance Minister, Mr Conor Murphy, to respond to the debate. The Minister will have 15 minutes. Minister. Uh, firstly, I would like to begin by thanking the members for bringing the debate. Uh, I would also like to add my voice to the condolences to themselves, their party colleagues, uh, and, and Billy Bell's family on his, his sad passing. I was here in 98 with Billy Bell when he was first elected, and I got to know him uh, over the years, and he was a gentleman. I, can, I, I am I'm very saddened to hear of his loss. Uh, and I suppose, being one of the shrinking club, I think, looking around me, I might be the only one who was elected here in 98. Uh, it, it fills me with dread when our newest member is, was referenced in her own age uh, when, the, when the Good Friday Agreement was struck. So I, I would also like to welcome her uh, to the Chamber and to, to the Assembly uh, and wish her well and look forward to working with her in the future. Uh, the motion that we have today starts by noting the stress experienced by members of the prison service in the course of their duties. Prison officers perform a difficult role, and I have no hesitation in recommending that the Assembly recognises that this is a stressful job. The motion further calls for the policy on inefficiency, sickness, absence management to take this stress into account and for compassionate management of mental health issues. The inefficiency, sickness, absence management policy aims to minimise sick absence and support people so that they can regularly attend work. It applies to all civil servants, including prison officers. The policy was implemented in 2010 in consultation with the recognised trade unions, who continue to work within the defined processes for managing all sickness absence. Under the policy, if an individual's absence is thought to be due to illness, people can be referred to a range of support services, including an internal welfare support service, specialist confidential counselling services provided by Inspire, and the Occupational Health Service. In addition, the prison service has worked with, with the Police Rehabilitation and Retraining Trust to provide bespoke support for prison officers who suffer from mental health issues or who require physiotherapy treatment. This external professional level of treatment is not provided to the wider civil service. The support available for staff who are absent is set out in the meetings undertaken and the letters issued by employee relations staff as part of the absence management procedures. It is worth noting that in 2019 there was a fundamental review of the letters used for absence management. The employee relations team worked closely with the Behavioural Science Unit and the Department of Finance and the recognised trade unions and departmental stakeholders to develop a suite of letters which focused on the individual who is absent offering support, clearly outlining each step of the process involved and who to contact and encouraging staff back to work. 
All prisons also have an on-site HR team to provide a face-to-face -face service, giving staff direct access to professional HR specialists who can provide support, confidential stress intervention meetings and advice on a wide range of personnel matters. There is also a dedicated team of experienced employee relations staff within the NIS, uh, NICSHR who directly support the Department of Justice and who take decisions on absence management. So the existing policy does take into account and provide support for stress and other health issues. However, if there are ways of improvement, I am more than happy to do so, and I have written to Mr Beatty to offer a meeting with my officials responsible for this policy. I do think the terminology used in the policy should change. The language of inefficiency is not a compassionate way to approach a situation in which an individual is absent from work due to illness. I understand that the use of the word inefficiency refers to the impact on the organisation when it cannot maintain the required staffing level, not to the individual involved. However, my officials accept that it is not appropriate and they are reviewing the use of the word inefficiency in the policy document as a matter of urgency. I have also asked the HR team to work with prison services across these islands to see if we can learn any lessons from them, including where line managers are more directly involved in this process. This motion specifically calls for an end to the written warnings for members of the prison service who are diagnosed with a mental health condition. A written warning is a letter that sets out the implications if attendance at work does not improve. Those implications can include a final written warning and ultimately dismissal. A staff member can appeal the decision to issue a warning. The appeal is heard by an individual previously unconnected with the decision to issue the warning. Removing the ability to issue a written warning could have profound unintended consequences. It would mean that a member of the prison service, if they have a mental health condition, could never attend work and no action could be taken. That is not a tenable position for any employer. I, I can correct, I think there was perhaps some overlap in, in Mr Carl's uh, contribution between this is a health issue, it is not a disciplinary issue, so the idea of written warnings in relation to disciplinary matters are a separate matter entirely, but this is specifically in relation to health. It is also likely that an exemption that only applies in terms of written warning to certain civil servants and certain illnesses would breach equality laws. So let me make it very clear to members the potential implication of this motion is that all civil servants with an illness will be able to absent themselves from work without consequence. I would there ask, ask, therefore ask members to think very carefully before endorsing the motion. Given these equality, policy, HR, employment contract and fairness implications, I could not accept that specific recommendation. Uh, and, and I do think it is uh, unfortunate, given the tenor of the debate, uh, the, the, the exchange between Mr Given and Mr Frew, that uh, people are basically opposing this on a technicality. It is much more than a technicality. Uh, it is a very serious implication. Uh, and I think the tenor of the debate was very supportive of the sentiment of the motion. But the fact that the solution to it, uh, one of the proposed solutions, is not correct and would cause uh, further complications uh, is, is beyond merely a technicality. And uh, it is something that I feel I cannot support. And I note others uh, seem to have expressed the same sentiment. However, I, as I said, given that aside, setting that aside, uh, I do agree with the rest of the motion. And I am happy to work with my officials and with the proposers of the motion and with everyone concerned to ensure that people who are absent from work due to mental health issues receive the support they need. Thank you, Minister. I call Mr Mike Nesbitt to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Mr Nesbitt will have 10 minutes. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed. And can I begin uh, in a traditional sense by thanking the mover of the motion, Mr Beatty. Um, I want to acknowledge that I believe mental health and well-being has come way up the political agenda during my time in, in this building. I think it was 2012 or 2013 when I first uh, made a speech about mental health and well-being. It was a party conference that was televised on a Saturday and I came here on the Monday and an MLA stopped me in the corridor and he said, I heard a bit of your speech on Saturday. He said, mental health? What's that all about? And he walked off. Well, I don't think there's any one of the 90 who doesn't get it uh, anymore. Uh, indeed, the draft programme for government begins by stating that our purpose is improving the well-being uh, of all our citizens. And I pay tribute, of course, to our health minister who is prioritising uh, mental health in his time uh, in that office. But I think today we have an example of the two actions that we need to take to tackle mental health and well-being. The first is awareness, uh, and I think largely we are there. But the second is action points. How are we going to deliver actions 
that will improve the mental health and well-being uh, of our citizens. Uh, and Mr Beatty, in opening the debate, made clear that prison officers are affected in a disproportionate way by these written warnings that are on their records for two years. And he also made clear that it was wrong, and I acknowledge the Minister saying that his department will look at this, that the use of the word inefficiency is inappropriate when we're talking about a medical condition. It suggests that the Department of the Civil Service don't understand that we have thousands of citizens, of our fellow citizens who woke up this morning with no sense of purpose in their lives, a sense of purpose which motivated us to get here today, and who will go to bed with no sense of achievement or frustration or a mixture of both, which will motivate them as it motivates us to get up and try harder tomorrow. And these, a lot of these people are on benefits, not because they want to be on benefits, but because they don't have the mental capacity that we enjoy. And that's why they're stuck in a rut, and that's why they need help. Now, I'm disappointed and I'm also shocked to hear that the House may divide on this debate, but certainly that it is not fully supported. Linda Dillard said it is too narrow a debate just to talk about prison officers. And she got some support from around the House. Mr Catney uh, talked about divergence and offering special treatment to prison officer staff. Mr Blair talked about uh, a separate process. Uh, and indeed, there were many who felt that this was wrong, including Gemma Dolan, uh, who acts as the workers' rights spokesperson, uh, for Sinn Féin, who complained about different treatment. But I, I want to say to her, are you actually just confusing equality with equity? Because there's no point giving everybody the same thing if they're not starting from the same place. You've got to get everybody onto a level playing field. You've got to have equity before you can start delivering uh, equality. I will give way. Thank you. Appreciate it. Just a quick point. I think I did address that in terms of the fact that I think you're right. Prison officers are not starting from the same point, and that's why we need to have a proper process in place in order to support them. I thank the member for her, for her intervention. But you did say it was too narrow. Uh, you also speculated it might not be compliant with employment law. But I've got to say to you, I mean, the motion was passed. It was accepted for debate. Uh, and it's not legislation. And is it a coincidence that the minister responding is a member of your party? I just ask the question. So is it about equality or is it about equity? Are prison officers a special case? Well, Mr Given, chair of the Justice Committee, was very eloquent in saying that prison officers work in special and very, very challenging circumstances. And he speaks as the son of a prison officer of 33 years standing. And he produced an evidence base, the Northern Ireland Audit Office, and a UK-wide analysis, which identified that among categories of civil servants, prison officers are particularly prone to mental health and to well-being issues. And his colleague, Mr. Frew, expanded on that because he said that prison officers have to interact with people who have massive mental health and well-being issues, and many of whom, or some of whom, are very dangerous people. And how right you are, as, as, as a victims commissioner 10 years ago, I learned very early that when you deal in that environment where you're dealing with people who have severe mental health and well-being issues, you absorb it. It gets transmitted to you. And I'm not ashamed to say that very quickly into my tenure, I started taking what they call supervision, which to anybody else is counselling, so that what I have absorbed, I was able to offload. So prison officers are a special case, working in a different, special and incredibly challenging environment. Mr uh, Given also made the point that although we're post-conflict, potentially, the same issues apply. You're not like a civil servant leaving this building or some other uh, executive department building and going home at night with no cares in the world. You might be under threat and you're taking home all those previous issues uh, that I mentioned. 
So I'm glad that the Minister agrees that they're going to look at inefficiency, uh, but I'm very disturbed that the House cannot row in behind this motion, because it is narrow, but why not? Why shouldn't we debate narrow issues in this chamber from time to time? Other speakers uh, today included Mr Little, uh, who was talking about sickness absence procedures, and Rachel Wood, who also wants to question uh, the process uh, by which warning letters uh, are, are, are issued. And Cara Hunter, uh, I join with others in welcoming her through her maiden speech. I would just say, next time you mention you're three years old, you were three years old when the agreement was signed, you will get an intervention. <laughs> And uh, the Minister, uh, I thank him for coming along today. Uh, I was listening to him, I was reminded actually, the England rugby team uh, came to play a Five Nations rugby match in Dublin in 1973 when other nations wouldn't travel because of the fear of terrorist attack. Ireland tanked England, absolutely thrashed them that day. Uh, and at the banquet that night, John Pullen, who was the captain of the England team, stood up and uttered the famous words, we mightn't be any good, but at least we turned up. So, Minister, thank you uh, for turning up. <laughs> uh, final thought, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Linda Dillon made a point that we must look after our prisoners. Jerry Carroll, Carroll made the same point. And I agree, of course we do. We want to rehabilitate them. There is an element of punishment, but we want, if, when they come out, we want them to be better citizens. I agree with you. But listen to this. Earlier today, Robin Swan, the Health Minister, came here to talk about rebuilding health and social care services post-COVID-19. And later today, I opened an email from the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust, uh, which is my patch in Strangford, with their action plan for this June. And their specific action plan for prison health, for prisoners. It says we will continue face-to-face -face appointments for prisoners with mental health issues and we will continue to increase our phone and video call options for our prisoners where it is beneficial. So we are looking after our prisoners, but we're doing it at a time when some prison officers are self-harming and some are going to waive trauma to get help. Some years ago, I brought forward a motion calling for a mental health champion. Sinn Féin would not support it. I was disappointed, but I did not divide the House over it. And I say to anybody who does not like this motion, please do not divide this House, because you will send the worst possible message to everyone in this country who is suffering poor mental health and well-being. The motion may not be perfect to you, it may be too narrow for you, but we've made the argument, I think successfully, prison officers are a special category. It's about equity, not equality. Please do not divide the House. Please support this motion. Thank you. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. No. Aye. aye. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. The House will divide. Order. Order. Members will resume their seats, please. Before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that the motion on the order paper in the name of Doug Beattie and Robbie Butler be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any. Do we have tellers? Order members.
tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the eyes are Doug Beatty and Paul Given. Tellers for the nose are Linda Dillon and Pat Catney. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote upon their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. It is important that during any division, social distancing in the Chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I am asking the following. Any members in the Chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the Chamber until the division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the Chamber to which they are sitting should leave the Chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the Chamber until this division has concluded. However, any member who needs to vote in both lobbies should remain in the Chamber. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times and to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks and to respond to the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order. Order. Members will resume their seats, please. Can I ask the clerk to please read the result? 83 members voted. 37 mo members voted aye. 46 members voted no. The motion is negatived. The motion is negatived. Unfasten the doors. <laughs>